Good morning. Good morning. Imagine getting fired from a multi-billion dollar company that you yourself founded. Envision suffering through three years in different Nazi concentration camps. Picture yourself walking into the shell of what had once been your home to find a watermark on the wall higher than you are tall. I've never founded a company, nor have I ever been fired from one, and I've never even visited a Nazi concentration camp. But that last one, with the watermark, that one's my own experience. By now you're probably wondering, what on earth do these three things have to do with each other? Let me take you back in time a bit. The year was 2005. I was 12 years old and had lived in Morganton, North Carolina for the 11 that I could remember. One day in April of 2005, my parents sat Hunter and me down and seemingly out of the blue told us that we were leaving Morganton and moving to New Orleans. Initially, I was excited. From the beginning, Louisiana had been like a second home to me. Since my parents were both born and raised there, and because just about all of my extended family lives or has lived there, I visited it frequently throughout my childhood. But then I got to thinking about leaving my friends, and excitement quickly turned into a bittersweet expectation. While I realize now that my parents made the decision to move for me and Hunter, at the time, I felt only sadness about leaving my friends and anxiety towards what the future could hold. My mom, Hunter, and I had been living in New Orleans without my dad for three months while he finished his job contract in Morganton. Hunter and I were a week into our new school, and both of us had just started making friends. Then, Hurricane Katrina hit. Thankfully, we were able to evacuate the day beforehand. After cramming as many things in our house as we could carry in the highest place as possible in order to save them in case of a flood, we packed up the car and evacuated. The next morning, we listened to the news broadcasts in horror as we learned that the levees had broken, flooding most of the city. Needless to say, we weren't going to be going home. I lived through this period of my life in a kind of daze. Like the kid in the popular YouTube video, David After Dentist, all I could think was, is this real life? <laughs> well, fortunately for David, laughing gas wears off after a few hours. Dealing with something like a natural disaster does not. And for the next few months, my state of mental shock gave all my experiences a certain dreamlike quality. Let me tell you, there are few experiences more surreal than that of walking into your home and seeing a five-foot-high watermark on the wall, then going through soggy boxes full of moldy, ruined toys, clothes, and other possessions. Even crazier was standing on a floor so warped by water damage that it seemed as though a small hill had appeared in the middle of our dining room, from the top of which I could at less than five feet tall, touch the ceiling that used to be ten feet above me. I took all of this in with numb acceptance. I didn't really know how to react, so I didn't. I just shut down. After a few weeks of living with various relatives in Louisiana, we moved back to Morganton. Once again, I found myself wondering if I was dreaming, as I found myself back with my old friends at the same school I had previously attended. But in December, my world was once again rocked by the news that my dad had gotten a job offer in Asheville and that once again, we were leaving Morganton. We arrived in Asheville in January of 2006. Unfortunately for me, along with the fresh pain of leaving my friends, came the discovery that it is very difficult to start a new school halfway through sixth grade year, especially when everyone in your class has been together since preschool and social groups were formed long before you ever arrived. There were many times during this period when I sat down and wondered why anything was worth it, whether I could go on, and why I even bothered trying. I resented my situation and felt that nobody understood what I was going through. I would lash out at any form of authority and took offense to just about every other word my parents spoke to me. Fights with my mother occurred on a daily basis, leaving me in an even darker mood than before. I was stuck in a downward spiral of helplessness and anger and rather than trying to do anything about it, I simply held it in and let my resentment for my trials consume me. I'm not really sure what happened to pull me back into reality. Maybe it was reading Touching Spirit Bear in my English class. Maybe it was the lyrics of one of the Bob Marley songs my advisor seemed to always have playing. Or maybe it was the kindness and acceptance my new friends displayed. All I know is that at some point it suddenly hit me 
that I had the chance to make something of my new situation. For one thing, I knew that I could get a fantastic education here. When we lived in Morganton, my parents would always jokingly tell people that when Hunter and I finished middle school, we would move to Asheville and go to the Asheville school. Funny how fate works sometimes, huh? <laughs> I also learned that becoming a part of this new community wasn't really as difficult as I had first thought. I was the one who made it harder. Probably the biggest benefit, though, was that my dad's new job would be less time-consuming than his old one. With his last job, my dad was gone so often that, when I was little, I believed he actually lived at the hospital and only came to our house to visit us every so often. <laughs> Moving here gave me the chance to see my whole family on a regular basis, an opportunity I was and am still thankful for every day. While my resentment and suffering had blinded me to the fact for some time, my trials presented me with so many opportunities that I am now thankful for them. In European studies last year, I stumbled upon the life and works of someone who shared my new outlook on life's trials. Victor Emil Frankl was an Austrian psychologist who spent three years of his life in Nazi concentration camps. In the camps, he saw what he came to refer to as give up-itis. Every so often, he witnessed a person refuse to get up in the morning and go to work, and neither threats nor warnings could change his mind. Eventually, he would take a lone cigarette out that he had managed to hide somewhere in his clothing and start smoking. At that moment, Frankel knew he was going to die. They had given up all hope, refused to see that their situation could ever improve. In short, they had given up on life. This experience caused Frankel to reflect on life and suffering. He decided that the search for meaning in life is the driving force for humans and dubbed his new ideas on suffering tragic optimism. This is not the same as the naive optimism of Dr. Pangloss in Voltaire's Candide, which states that this is the best of all possible worlds, so everything that happens is for the best. Frankel asserted that often things do not work out for the best. We stumble, we fail, and bad things do happen. But he also believed that life has meaning, that every trial and every failure can teach us a lesson and make us better people, provided, of course, that we don't give up. As he writes in his book, Man's Search for Meaning, quote, Even the victim of a hopeless situation, facing a fate he cannot change, may rise above himself, may grow beyond himself, and by so doing, change himself. He may turn a personal tragedy into a triumph, end quote. But as fascinating as World War II era Viennese psychologists are, another individual with whom we are all much more familiar embodied Frankel's ideals perfectly. In his speech given at Stanford University's 114th commencement in 2005, Steve Jobs addressed the same issues as Viktor Frankl. Using several stories from his life, Jobs discussed perseverance and dealing with personal tragedies. In one of these stories, he speaks of what he believed to be one of the most pivotal experiences of his life, being fired from Apple. Yes, I said Apple, as in the iPod, iPhone, iPad, Apple the one Steve Jobs himself started with his friend in his parents' garage. His story goes like this. In 10 years, Apple went from being a two-man project to a multi-billion dollar Fortune 500 industry employing thousands of people. With Apple's recent success, Jobs decided to bring on John Scully, head of Pepsi-Cola, as Apple's new CEO. But the relationship between the two quickly went south. When the board of directors sided with Scully in 1985, they fired Jobs. In his speech at Stanford, he said, quote, What had been the focus of my entire adult life was gone, and it was devastating, end quote. While he initially felt lost, after a few months, Jobs decided to pick up the pieces. He started the company Next Incorporated, met his future wife, and created a computer graphics company I'm sure you all know. Hint, its trademark is an animated lamp that looks around, innocently hops up to the company's name, and ghetto stomps the eye. <laughs> the company? Pixar. Jobs said that, quote, I didn't see it then, but it turned out that getting fired from Apple was the best thing that could have ever happened to me, end quote. I'm sure we can all agree with him. If Jobs hadn't been fired from Apple in the first place, he never would have been rehired when it bought his company Next Incorporated, and therefore, he wouldn't have gone on to be Apple's CEO. Next Incorporated pretty much created the OS X and iOS operating systems, 
So if Steve Jobs hadn't been fired from Apple and gone on to create Next, we wouldn't have iPods, iPhones, iPads, or modern Macs. And since Pixar never would have been founded, you can forget about these classic movies. Toy Story, A Bug's Life, Monsters, Inc., The Incredibles, or Finding Nemo. Ooh. <laughs> All of these things were made possible because Steve Jobs made the most of his situation. By persevering, he found the opportunities his situation presented and turned his personal tragedy into a triumph. In the moment, it is often difficult to see how our sufferings or our failures can lead to anything other than pain. But I'm a firm believer that they can, provided we persevere and make the most of the opportunities they present. So whenever you're feeling down, when you feel like dealing with life, homework, classes, friends, or family issues is impossible, or if you encounter a more serious problem, like, say, a hurricane, don't give up. It may be impossible to put the pieces together at the time, to see the bigger picture, and to know how all of our experiences will connect to make some sort of sense. But as Steve Jobs once said, quote, you can't connect the dots looking forwards. You can only connect them looking backwards. So in the meantime, you have to trust that the dots will somehow connect in your future. You have to trust in something, your gut, destiny, life, karma, whatever. Because believing that the dots will connect down the road will give you the confidence to follow your heart, even when it leads you off the well-worn path. And that will make all the difference. And it does. As I look back on my experiences and connect all the dots, I see a picture I wouldn't trade for the world.